Um, good morning, everyone. Um, um, this is we come back to the third day of the, our summer school. Um, today, uh, we are going to uh, uh, have uh, uh, two speakers, Professor uh, Xiaodong Xu and uh, Professor with Vanessa, uh, talk about uh, uh, 2D. Uh, uh, so, Professor Xu will talk about the 2D magnets and heterostructure. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, I think it works, right? So today I'm gonna um, about two lectures and uh, on 2D magnets and uh, header structures. So as any you know, if you watch a movie online or, or YouTube or Netflix anything, right? The first thing you saw is actually commercials, right? So here's my commercial. <laughs> and uh, in case you haven't been to Seattle, actually it's a really beautiful place. Here's the picture I took uh, near. There's a park called. It's a gasworks park near the campus. And uh, it's gorgeous view. We can take pictures of the, 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 the skyline of the cities. And uh, you know, we have uh, space needles, right? There's a football stadium just near here. We used to be a champion. Okay. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, Seattle is always famous for, for, for coffee. This is actually the, the first Starbucks uh, in, in downtown. I mean, in the whole world, so. And we also have a lot of risk, with, uh, you know, in case you're into this, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> Here's uh, the, the campus. We have, uh, uh, this is, uh, took a few years ago, but uh, we have these uh, lecture halls, we have office, labs, and we have these uh, peanut shape. Nobody knows what it is, but I call it the P optical. <laughs> All right. And, you well know, right? Uh, the, the, my department, we have these uh, brilliant theorists, David Salas, and uh, unfortunately passed away this year. But uh, in build on you know, Salas' legacy, we, we have these, uh, uh, we originally just started this uh, Salas Institute for Quantum Matter, so TIQM. I think that the, the kickoff will be next January. And we're going to have fellowships of visitor programs, and uh, well, you, you guys are welcome to, to come. And, and here, here's a real commercial. The real commercial is uh, we, we actually, you know, in the last few years and uh, in the near future, we, we, the condensed matter program, especially in the quantum material, uh, grow rapidly. <coughs> so here's the main uh, experimental for the first row, and the second row is the theorist. And we cover a broad range of topics in the quantum materials, right, from superconductivities, magnets, topological materials, Strong correlations, anything which is interesting. So, and as far as I know, all, all the PS are looking for for postdocs. If you're interested, I'm sure you know we have a lot of the candidates here. And uh, please feel free to drop us an email. All right, I'm done. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm I'm not finished. So so we. We also have uh, um, in, in, in in last couple of years, right? There's the there's a huge effort in terms of quantum computing, and the Seattle is a, is a great place. Everybody, probably you guys all know, Microsoft actually putting a lot of resources in developing this uh, topological quantum computing. And uh, I just met you know Leo Holland, for example, a couple of days ago. He come to Seattle every two months, the same as Charlie Lieber. I'm oh, sorry, Charlie Marcus. So we also build these uh, quantum X in, in, uh, in, in, in the campus. And uh, in addition to that, we have a couple, we have actually several quantum material centers. For example, uh, uh, this one is uh, the MEMC, which is uh, uh, the, the, the NSF-supported NSF MERSEC center. ProQM is a uh, uh, EFRC center supported by DOE. It's a joint effort between Columbia University of Washington and also Carnegie Mellon Universities. And the last one is called Northwest Impact. It's a joint effort between uh, University of Washington and uh, also Pacific Northwest National Lab. So we have a lot of things going on. It's a, it's a great place right now. All right, so today I'm gonna talk about 2D materials and you've probably heard a lot already, right, for this week. I'm gonna quickly go through this, right? 2D material has a broad range of physical properties from graphene into semi-metal, we can have semiconductors, <coughs> superconductors, or fer ferroelectrics, for example, and uh, you know, quantum spin hot insulators, you probably heard yesterday already, right? And so starting from several years ago, when I look at the, you know, all these material systems, and what I realized is there's, there's something was missing, was two-dimensional magnets. 
<laughs> so we, it's not only uh, important, right? For it's not only important for for basically to to kind of uh, uh, complete a toolbox of two D material, but I think there's actually potential real applications we can do. You know, for all these data storage, for data centers, for cloud computing, etc. The the from fundamental physical point of view, we all know that uh, these uh, magnetism being studied for a long time. Why we want to go two dimensional? And uh, my motivation is, as any uh, three-dimensional solid-state systems, right, the basic material properties, such as uh, the thermal surface, critical symmetry is a given. But uh, for kinetic matter, if you want to understand the electronic phases or, or control the phase transition between different electronic phases, <coughs> well, what we would like to do is actually want to control the phase property in situ, right, to tune one phase to the other, for example, or just control the thermal levels, control the crystal symmetries, for examples. This can be done in a bulk crystal, but it's but it's challenging, right? So what we know is for the two-dimensional system, actually, it's a timely thing. So what it means is, well, it's easy to, to apply electrostatic gatings to, to the system and uh, can, can drastically dope the system and induce, for example, phase transitions. Or we can just apply electric fields to the system and, uh, and change the fundamental properties. We can also well, do heterostructure engineering. We all know right, scotch tape is powerful technique, even though it's very simple. And because of Van der Waals forces, and we can stack any 2D material on top of any 2D materials. So these give us a lot of freedom and flexibilities to, to engineer artificial quantum structures. And I think we are only limited by imaginations. So the last one is uh, the, the control we can apply, right? Not only just by electric field, you know, by interface effects. There's a, there's a, you, you all know, right? There's a trace angle control can create a, a new electronic states. And we can also apply strings because anything when you, when you, any materials when you think down to a two dimensional, you can apply large string to it, right? Just like silicon, for example, if you can make a model of silicon, actually you can apply a lot of string. <coughs> so th this is the advantage you can get with two D. And uh, the other very powerful technique we 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 we're trying right now is pressures. So we know pressure actually is, is a useful technique to, for example, to get the high pre uh, high temperatures with superconductivity, right? But for 2D materials, it's a vanilla structures. So interlayer coupling actually is critical. And then the pressure actually is a very useful technique to control this interlayer coupling, right? For example, by control the, the interlayer separations or just control this layer stacking arrangement. Okay? So I'm gonna show you an example today. All right, so here's a, a all of my lectures. Actually, I'm, I think I may be a little bit amb ambitious, but we'll see how far we can go. So in the first part, I'm going to talk about the fundamental property of these uh, um, particular magnets, which is chromium and triode. I'm going to show you the fundamental property of these. And then, then at the end, I'm going to show you our new progress in terms of understanding how the stacking arrangement you know, change these magnetic properties. And the second part, I'm going to look, focus a little bit more on hair structures. But initially, I will I'll talk about uh, our uh, recent work on electric control of 2D magnetisms. Then, then I'll show you a, a, a very exciting example, actually. Yeah, personally, I'm pretty excited about it. So these new effects of spin lattice couplings in these 2D magnets. Then the, the last part, I'm going to show you how we can use proximity effect to control the spins, pseudo spins, or even topological edge states in, in quantum spin hot insulators. All right. So um, like I say, the 2D magnets, or, or magnetism itself, has been studied for many, many years. But uh, if you look into the literature, you will find actually there's, there was no monolayer semiconductor or insulator with intrinsic magnetism. The close example is because diluted magnetic semi semiconductors. But just as the name indicates, right, for this diluted magnetic semiconductor, the spin density is low in the system. Therefore, it will limit the fundamental physics you, you can study because of these low spin densities. The second is, well, monolayer metals actually with intrinsic magnetism indeed exist. For example, you know, like the monolayer cobalt on copper and monolayer nickel on copper. But uh, the substrate is copper is quite important, actually. Therefore, the isolated 2D magnets actually did not exist. The, the challenge, what I, what I see is, uh, in the past, when you, go to, when, when you try to get these uh, um, two-dimensional magnets, they usually use a sputtering or use MBEs, right? So the, those are kind of a 
uh, a challenging technique to, to go really thin because, for example, use MBE. You can get a model layer, but uh, you cannot grow any model layer or any materials. The substrate is really important. So FP texture matching right, is really important. But we all know now we can go 2D materials. For a Van der Waals crystals, if you can find any Van der Waals magnets, and uh, if you're lucky, they can add fully into Malay, then there's a chance we can get a 2D magnets. Okay, not every one or crystal can be as folated. Okay, so you have to be very lucky. And, and so when we start this project, we, we kind of focus on these uh, uh, highlight systems. There's many of them, as you see here, right? There's a, a list of them. They have a very different many orders. And uh, the, the challenge is to find out which one is a good one. For example, as a student, right? If you started with a uh, crystal, and you try to fully, it doesn't work. They will tell your advisor, okay, it doesn't work. And you very quickly, you may lose your passion on it, right? <laughs> That's the truth. So, luck is very important. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out we're very lucky. We started with this chromium triad. And uh, we started from this because uh, we don't have a choice. My collaborator only have this crystal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, either you try it or don't try it, right? So, okay, I, I told my student, then, then let's try this program and try that. I, well, well, the nice thing is that the student I asked, I asked to do it, he was a first year graduate student. So he's uh, you know, highly motivated. What I told him is, nobody has seen 2D manners before. If you did it, you're going to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't tell him is, if you failed, actually, I, I'm going to add another year in your graduate school. <laughs> 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 but, uh, well, he's a lucky guy, so. <laughs> so, so initially, you know, when, when, when we also work with uh, Pablo's group, actually, try, try to get these monoliths, because these monoliths, uh, these 2D manners, uh, they, they are easily exfoliated, but uh, they are also not stable in the ambient conditions. So we work always in a, in a glass box, and here I just show you optical microscope image of the samples. Right? Just by optical contrast, you can already see one layers, two layers, three layers, etc. So it's quite easy to exfoliate. The only challenge is uh, it's just not stable in the ambient conditions. And uh, my my collaborator Michael McGuire actually he initially when he told me you know um, about his uh, chromium triad, what 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 gave me really interested is uh, he he showed from his uh, magnetic from his uh, screen measurements he showed these these particular crystal has very strong outplane anisotropies. So this is very important because uh, we all know as you think down the crystals, right, there's a Merman Wigner theory. It says if the in exchange interaction, you know, has a Merman exchange interaction is anisotropic, then there's no, no long range order in a, in a 2D or lower dimensional limit, right? But the, so we need anisotropies. And what he showed is there's very strong outplane anisotropies with lower spin point in other planes. This is good news, right? The second thing, what he told me is, the Curie temperature actually quite high for the bulk crystal. It's a 60 Kelvin. This is also important because, as we know, when you think down, the Curie temperature may drop. But there's a lot of room below 60 Kelvin, right? So, so both uh, uh, problems in signatures. So we started on this, like I said, we asphalted it, and uh, we, we built these uh, magneto optical curve rotation measurements. And it's quite a simple technique. If the essence is uh, you shine linearly polarized light to the samples, and then you look at the, the polarization rotation in you know, the reflected light. So this angle is called curl rotation angles, and uh, the curl rotation angle is uh, is is, uh, is kind of a hallmark of uh, uh, time reversal symmetry breaking in the systems. Well, the 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 subtlety is uh, if you just see you know the rotation of the light, doesn't mean you have a curl rotation, okay? Because uh, there could be artifacts in the system give you a little bit of rotation of the angle. So the real measurements you should do is uh, you measure curl rotation, but as function magnetic field, as I show here. So there's two curves here, right? One is uh, the magnetic field scan up, the other magnetic field scan down. So if you you measure the curl rotation as function magnetic field, it's called Monk. If you see a hysteresis, that tells you you do have a ferromagnetism in the system. Okay, that's important. So for, you know from now. Right? If you see a hysteresis, you know there's ferromagnetism. That's the main technique we're going to use. So the measurement that down here is in a bulk crystal. Then we just go directly to the model layer. And the, the, what I show you here is uh, 
the correlation in testing math without applying magnetic field. And the temperature is 15 Kelvin. Basically, we just cool down the sample and uh, doing nothing else. Then what I'm showing here is a map, right? You already see this homogeneous correlation signals across the sample. Indicates we do have a ferromagnetism in this monolayer. But as I just mentioned to you, C correlation signal doesn't mean we do have it. So we'll, we can park the laser at one spot in the sample, then I scan the magnetic field, and then we see this hysteresis curve. So this does prove we do have a ferromagnet with other plane spins. So this is a, actually it's an icing ferromagnet for these particular examples. We can also measure the remnant magnet uh, correlation signals as as function of the temperature. So these give us the measurement of the curie temperature in the model. Actually, it's 45 Kelvin, not too far from the bulk crystal. Right, it's about 60 Kelvin. So the, oh, this just shows for this model, there, ferromagnet has pretty strong all the plane magnetic and isotropies. And what, what, what's really interesting in the system is uh, we have these uh, layer-dependent magnetic uh, properties. For example, in the model layer, right, I have these, uh, uh, you already see this correlation, this hysteresis. When you go to the bilayer, the hysteresis vanishes, the correlation signal also vanishes at the small fields. And if you go to trilayer, the signal comes back. So initially, we kind of puzzled by this for, 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 for a long time, and then we, we realized it's caused by these uh, layer kind of a, uh, layer into layer coupling, it's anti-ferromagnetic. So what that means is, first of all, when the magnetic field is large, right, you can align all the spins in one direction. So we get the, uh, we get the magnetic stations, then we see large coefficient signals. However, when you're at the small magnetic field, for individual model layer, it is still ferromagnetic, but into layer coupling now becomes anti-ferromagnetic. So the magnetization actually is compensated, right? Therefore, there's no net magnetization. So there's two, type, two ground states. They are time reversal of each other. Then, then we can extend this concept in the trilayer. So we can understand why trilayer, there's actually a hysteresis curve, right? So for the trilayer, if we, based on bilayer, we know the interlayer coupling is anti-ferromagnetic. Then in the trilayer, we should have a structure like this, right? You know, for example, the top layer has been pointing up, and the middle pointing down, and the bottom pointing up. So we have a up, down, up configuration. If we consider the magnetization for individual model as a unit, which is one, then you will know, right, the magnetization, total magnetization for this particular state should be two minus one, should be just one, right? Then there should be another state which time reversal of these, then the net magnetization will be minus one. Okay? Then, without any calculation, you know the correlation signal from the top states to the bottom states, the ratio should be around one, right? That's exactly what we see. Okay? Then you can convince yourself. If you apply magnetic field to align all the spin in the same directions, now you count it, the total magnetization should be three, right? Then the, then the ratio of the correlation signal to these uh, ground states should be three to one. So that's also what we see, okay? So, so this actually kind of a very simple, but uh, just easy to understand what is uh, magnetic states by just measure the correlation signal, okay? So the same thing we can get, uh, you know, the other one is around minus three. So each step, whether you show here, is a spin flip transition. Basically one layer flip its magnetizations. So the, we can also understand the, the, the same feature for the four layers, right? The ground state is, uh, is up, down, up, down, with net magnetization close to zero. And then, once we apply magnetic field, and then one layer flipped, okay? Therefore, there will be three layer pointing up and one layer pointing down. This, but the, 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 complex, the complexity coming from this minority layer with spin pointing down. This, this minority layer can be anywhere in the system, right? So can, there's a full position for it. But they corresponding to the same magnetization m equal to two. So by this correlation measurements, actually, I cannot tell what is the ground state of this one. Later on, I'm going to show you how we can distinguish this, okay? And the last one is uh, you, you apply the field and you get net magnetization 4. <coughs> then you can see the signal from the, the these states, right, to the intermediate state should be 2 to 1. So that's about what we see, okay? The top is 14, the middle level is 7. So everything works well. So the, the short summary is, for monolayer chromium trilayer is an intrinsic ferromagnet. 
And for atomic thin chromium triad, actually, it's a layered antiferromagnet. The interlayer coupling is antiferromagnetic. So the next question I want to address is uh, what's, the, the, what's the insulated property of the systems? So we, I'm going to talk about the spin polarized, the ligand field, the photoluminescence on the systems. And first of all, I want to say is uh, before, you know, I, I looked into the literature about uh, what the chromium triad is, actually. When we started, there are only five papers from 1960-something to now, right? Only five papers on, actually less than five. And if I look into the literature, there's no single report on any of the, you know, photoluminescence from these uh, uh, magnetic insulators with intrinsic magnetism. So for any, um, for, for any Van der Waals crystal, if you see them down, there's no guarantee you're going to see luminescence, right? So we can also lucky here. So that, the basic idea is very simple. What I told my students is, well, if it's an insulator, there will be a gap, and you shine light to it, you should see luminescence. But it, this is not the truth, actually. You know, I will tell you why. And we also got lucky here. So the, the measurement we did is we shared linearly polarized light to a sample. So linear polarization, right, is a, is a superposition with the sigma plus and sigma minus. Doesn't break time reversal symmetries of the system. Then we measure the, we do this circular polarization resolve the PO measurements. If the system doesn't break time reversal symmetries, then there should be no prefer, there's no preference to right or left circular, right? But if you see a spontaneous circular polarization, it will means the system actually has time reversal symmetry breaking. So the data I show you here well, is color coded. If it's right circular, it will be red color. If it's left circular, it will be blue color. And uh, you know, the first question is one well, just actually can we see full luminous? And the second is how does it connect to manifestations? And initially, what my student did is, uh, you know, well, he just shone light to, to a malware, and he indeed see a luminescence. But the, te the data is taken at the 70 Kelvin, which is above the curie temperature. There's another story in these measurements. You can see is that the luminescence actually come out the 1.1 EV. So 1.1 EV is very close to the silicon gap. So a sample we have is all at the silicon right at the time, right? And it's very difficult to, to distinguish the signal is from a sample or from the substrate. At least my student convinced me to buy a nice detector for him, which is $40,000, <laughs> just looking for the single peak, which is maybe there, may not be there. And uh, it was dangerous because he, uh, it's already his fourth year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if he fell, he's he, he going to be punished. But uh, luckily, right, it worked. So later on, what they, once we realized there's a, there's a real signal, what they did is now we make sample actually on sapphire, because the sapphire doesn't have a gap at the 1.1 EV. Okay. The other thing I want to point to you is you can see the intensity actually is extremely weak. It's only like 0.4 counts per microwatt per second. It's, it's about two or, oh, at least two to three order of magnitude smaller than these, uh, uh, for example, you know, transition metal dichotinites. Okay, extremely weak. So you have to be very patient when you're taking this data. The, the next, what we did is just cool down the sample to 15 Kelvin. Again, right, we don't apply any magnetic field, okay? There's no magnetic field applied in the whole process. Now you see, well, there's a spontaneous circular polarization in the system, right? This PO shows it's circular polarized. This demonstrates well, that indeed a fermion order spontaneous form and it's out of plane. Right? Out of plane is important because in plane, right, the, the light circular, you know, with angular momentum going out of plane. If the magnetization is in plane, actually, you're also not going to see these circular polarizations. So this is a kind of independent measurement of many order, okay? Then the next thing we do is want to prove it is indeed coming from many order. Then we, we measure the luminescence as function of many field. And the, the top is starting from zero Tesla. Then we increase the many field and actually flip the magnetization to the up direction. So you can see the, the, the polarization is flipped, right? The red now is stronger than blue. Then we can go back to zero Tesla because of hysteresis, right? And the memory effect. Then the the polarization is still radically stronger. Then again, until I apply a large enough negative field to flip the polarization, so now the, the signal polarization is also flipped. Okay? So we can plot the degree of polarization as function of the magnetic field, and we see this hysteresis curve here. So this hysteresis curve I show you here is very different from the MOC I just told you, right? MOC is a measure actually the, the light scattering from the sample at the same frequency. But this, what I measure here, is luminescence, which is light emitted from the sample itself. 
But both shows these hysteresis coming from, you know, they point to the same origin of the signal, which is the ferromagnetic order. Okay. The other thing we did is we, then we, we can look at the, the luminescence from bilayer, right? At the large negative field, we see uh, uh, circular polarizations, where in the anti ferromagnetic state, right, and magnetization equals zero. Now you can see the, the, the spontaneous signal polarization actually vanishes. Then we can apply a positive field right, to polarize the systems. Now the spontaneous polarization comes back. All right. And then I can plot the degree of polarization as function of magnetic field in this plot. Right. But it looks very similar to the MOOC. So everything is consistent. The last thing I want to mention to you is that I, I, I told you that the signal is very, very small. This because the transition I'm looking at here, actually, it's a, it's a molecular orbital transition. So they always say it's a, you know, it's happened between, in this uh, chromium atom, which is a 3D of, it's a 3D uh, ions, so therefore we match actually a D to D transition, which is uh, uh, symmetry forbidden, because there's no change of angular momentum, right? And, but the reason we can see that, because uh, the crystal itself, you look at the union cells, it's a chromium atom in the center, then with uh, six outer on the corner, it's octahedral edge sharing structures. So if you're familiar with uh, chemistry, at that time, actually, I don't, you know. So I have to talk to my, my chemist colleague. He said, well, this is the common way. Right? It's just a ligand field. At that time, actually, I never heard of what a ligand field is. So, so now I know, right? For octahedral symmetry, and especially with transition metal structure like that, all the electronic transition is considered as a molecular orbital transition, highly localized, OK? But what it means is that the transition happens in the inside of these unit cells. Then because it's a um, ligand field in the, for chromium it has 3D orbitals, the physical property is determined by the orientation of this orbital I show you here. For example, you know, there's uh, five of them. I show dxy, dxc, dy. If you, if you study group theory, you will know what I'm talking about, right? All these angles is important. And there's another two, which is uh, symmetric, which is this one. So it depends on the angle of these orbitals, then they can talk differently to these uh, uh, outer items. Right? Then there will be different mixtures to, to these orbitals. So I won't go into all the details of that, but the, the, the short summary is uh, before the transitions we, 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 we care about actually is from these uh, three. The ground state is A24, the, 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 then there's a T24 and a T14. So the, the A and the T is a represent the, 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 the irrepresent, uh, irreducible representations, the, the group basically. Uh, here, what I show you is. Uh, the reflection measurements from the samples, and you can see there's uh, about four peaks. The lowest energy one is coming from the transition I show you here, from A24 to T24. Then there's another one, what I show you here, is from A24 to T14. Both of them is coming from these D2D transitions. The reason, as just mentioned to you, right, D2D transition is uh, actually so much forbidden. But the reason we can see this D2D transition here, because first of all, there's anisotropic phonons. So anisotropic phonons actually can break the local symmetries. The second is uh, in these, uh, uh, I'm going to show you a little later, is uh, so if you from the top, you look at the top of the crystal structure, there's a six chromium atom next, you know, from a hexagonal layer structure. So between chromium and chromium, actually there's exchange field. So this exchange field is anisotropic. It can also break the, the inversion symmetry in these uh, octahedral union cells. And the last is uh, for these transition metal, if you have these octahedral union cells, there's a, a famous uh, kind of empirical rule is the young Taylor distortion can, can come into play. So all these three uh, factors can break these local inversion symmetries. Then once if you broke the inversion symmetries, then this D2D transition will become symmetry a lot, but still very weak. Then there's two, the other two peaks at the, at the high energy side here, what I show you. So this is coming from the ligand field transition. What it means is from the transition between the chromium, the orbitals, to the P of those from these aldi, okay? So these kind of charge transfer transitions. Then the luminescence, what I should show here, is coming from 1.1 1 .1 EV, right? It's also from the lowest ground states. But there's a huge energy difference between the absorption to these luminescence. So this difference coming basically shows there's an extremely strong phonon, electron phonon interaction system. So this shift is coming from these, uh, uh, basically, it's a measure of uh, you know, the, the phonon rate strength. The, the, the electron phonon interactions. Yes. Yeah. 
Did you try to add a add an electric field to explicitly break the inversion symmetry to see whether the signal gets amplified or not? Yeah, I think we did that. I don't see. I don't think we see strong effects there. So the the. The reason is uh, I think this electric field actually, you know, you can break inverse symmetry, but it's just too weak compared to the internal field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just too weak. Okay. So, so far I covered the fundamental property. Now I'm going to uh, take a step forward and we'll look at uh, some effects we can do with these uh, 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 layered antiferromagnets. So the first example is, uh, right, this Coleman triad is a layered antiferromagnet insulator, <coughs> and we can go very thin. Uh, in, in 2D materials, there's a very famous, right, a kind of a wonder insulator, which is hexagonal boron nitride. You know, using hexagonal boron nitride, we can create the devices with really high qualities to access the physics you cannot do with low quality devices, for example. Or you can use hexagonal boron nitride as a tunnel barrier to make a you know tunnel tunneling down. Then, then in our case. Chromium triad I consider is a solid like boron nitride, probably not as uh, good as a substrate, but it has uh, a magnetic functionality, right? So we can use that to observe new features. Okay, so the example I'm going to tell you is uh, these general tunneling magnetic resistance with the spin filter effect. So what I mean is we know these uh, GMR effects, right? In the traditional GMR, you have two ferromagnetic contacts and with a tunnel barrier, which is non-magnetic. So it depends on the relative orientations from these two ferromagnetic contacts. They can be parallel or anti-parallel, right? Then from there, we get this uh, ratio of this uh, resistance, then we get a tunneling magneto resistance TMR. So usually the, the, the tunnel barrier is uh, critical for the TMR, and for state-of-the-art, if you know, they use MGOs, and then you can match the, the momentum, you know, the scattering momentum, etc., of the MGO by just pick particular 3D magnets. So the state-of-the-art for this TMR, for this particular system, is on the other 500 at room temperature and about 1300 at low temperature. Okay. Then there's another scheme, it's called spin filter TMR. So for this scheme, the Difference is now the contacts becomes non-magnetic, but the tunnel barrier is magnetic. Okay, in particular for this tunnel barrier, imagine you have two spin filters, so you can switch the system from these two spin filters aligned with each other or anti-aligned with each other. Then in this case, we can also realize tunneling magnetic resistance, right? But the, the challenge is, how can we get a material? You know, how can we get a magnet? with these type of uh, spin filter functions. Basically, switch from aligned and anti-aligned uh, configurations. So, about uh, you know, 10 years ago, right, the group at the <coughs> MIT from the Dell group, they engineered these artificial spin filters with europium sulfide and with aluminum oxide and another europium sulfide. The reason they put aluminum oxide is, uh, first of all, they don't want these two europium Sapphire talk to each other. Otherwise, uh, you cannot uh, distinguish the property of these two European sapphire, right? The second is that they grow different thickness of these European sapphire. Then they have a slightly different cohesive field. Then you can treat them as a different spin filters. With that, you can ob obtain these uh, uh, spin filter tunneling effects and with this TMR on about 30% uh, of the low temperature, okay? So the drawback of the, these type of systems is you can see First of all, it's a complex structures, and uh, the second is it's actually thick. So for study any tunneling behavior, we know the tunnel barrier need to be thin, right? Otherwise, the, the tunneling is not going to work. It's not a quantum mechanic tunneling anymore. And it turns out the bilayer chromium triad that I just talked to you is a perfect spin filters, right? You know, the <laughs> spin ground state is exactly at two spin filters but anti-aligned with each other, right? It's internally anti ferromagnet coupled. Therefore, if you pass current through the systems, it will be suppressed. Then we can also apply magnetic field to align two spin filters in the same directions, then the tunneling current will be increased. We can also align the spin filter in horizontal direction, for example. So, this is just a, a basically the bile CI3 is a kind of perfect system to realize these spin filter effects. 
Uh, here, here's a device image. We have a graphing on top and bottom as a context, and we have a bilayer CI3 in the middle as a, a pattern bearers. Here's just an optical image of the device. And the first way measure the tunneling current as function that apply the bias at a zero Tesla. Then I can increase the magnetic field to allow the spin in the vertical direction. Now you can see the red curve, right? The current is stronger than the purple one. It can also align the spin in the horizontal directions. The tunneling current is even a little stronger. So the difference between these, uh, you know, the spin align all the plane and the in plane. Is coming from, it shows basically as an isotropic manual resistance in the system. So <clears throat> we can define these tunneling manual resistance, follow these uh, uh, definitions. And what we found is for bilayer, we can already get these uh, an TMR on the order of uh, several hundred, right? From four, five, four, four, 400 to 500 percent. So these are already much larger. Then the European satellite system you can get, and close to the state the art of MGO systems. <laughs> so we can confirm the phenomena we see is coming from these uh, spin filter effects. So the top curve, the top, the top panel I show you here, here, just a second. The top panel is uh, the curve rotation measurements give us the magnetic states. The bottom is uh, the same device. We do tunneling measurements. So you can see, right, the tunneling measurements. At the uh, low field is uh, the current is, the tunneling current is suppressed corresponding to these anti ferromagnetic ground states, and uh, when the magnetic field is large, right, all the spin is aligned, the tunneling current becomes large. So this is a sharp transition, in, it's a spin flip transition as we see in these smoke measurements. So everything is consistent, and we can extend this idea into into a um, little bit more complicated systems. Right? Uh, I can ignore these slides. This basically shows we can apply in plane magnetic field, and to see these spin canting effects, and to measure these uh, anisotropic field, which is about 3.8 Tesla. So we can further increase the TMR by incre increase the layer numbers. So this is what's nice about spin filter concept, because uh, then you can artificially create, uh, you know, add functions to these uh, uh, spin filter in the middle, right? So if you go to tri-layer, now you will see in the tri-layer you have two interfaces compared to the one interface in these bilayers. Therefore, you already imagine, right, the tunneling manual resistance will be increased. So this is exactly what we see for the tri-layer, okay, we have this curve rotation map and with these uh, tunneling current measurements, we do observe this uh, TMR increase to about 3,000%. And we can keep doing that, go to four layers, for example, then the, 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 the interface for this uh, anti ferromagnetic coupling increases, then the TMR can go as large as uh, 20,000. And uh, as other group shows, you can keep increasing that. You, know, you can go to even million percent. But what I, what I want to show you here is a four, in the four layer, in the tunneling measurements, we see a plateau showed up. So this intermediate state is corresponding to the in, intermediate you know magnetization state I showed in the MOC measurements, right? So this is nice. The reason is well because if we think about each step corresponding to one bit, then there's a potential to realize multi-bit storage, right? Imagine, you know, in the magnetization system, you know, what we do now is you have a spin up, spin down, so it's a zero and a one. But it's possible you can engineer multiple states, then we can increase the, the storage capacity. Just not just zero, not just one, you can have zero, one, two, three, four, for example. It depends on the layer configuration we're going to put in there. Okay. All right, I'm going to go back to this a little bit later. But the key message is, well, there's m equal two states here. These m equal two states corresponding to these intermediate plateaus. I'm going to show you how, how, how we can do some kind of a manipulation on this particular state. All right, so now I'm going to go to the, the you know, what I told you, the first part is uh, you can already find it that we published. And uh, in the last part, I'm going to show you some new results. One of them is going to actually show up today. Uh, in nature, and uh, the other one hopefully we're going to come out soon. Okay, so there's actually a mystery in this uh, interlayer anti ferromagnetism, right? I told you, you know, this, I was puzzled at the beginning by these uh, interlayer anti ferromagnetic couplings. The reason I was puzzled because uh, before our work, there are already theoretical calculations on these uh, particular crystals, and what they show is the, the crystal CR3 itself should be ferromagnetic from Ball crystal all the way to monolayers. 
But clearly, my experiment shows actually the atomic thing limit is anti ferromagnetic couple, right? So what's going on there? And also, my collaborator, his bulk crystal measurement also shows it's, anti it's a ferromagnetic. And uh, in the last couple of years, uh, there's uh, uh, quite a bit uh, theory work. And uh, in his uh, theory work, what they show is, uh, uh, you, you see his keywords, right? Stacking. And uh, oh, they also now work shows, uh, you know, basically in the supplementary, they also discuss uh, the, the stacking, the impact of stacking on, 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 on the magnetic orders. So here, just summarize uh, the, the key concept is, for these uh, crystals, the calculation shows there could be two stable stacking order. One is rhombohedral, it's called AB. The other is monoclonic, AB prime. Then for these two different uh, uh, stacking order, for the rhombohedral, we'll get the ferromagnetic order. For, but for the monoclonic stacking, actually we'll get the anti ferromagnetic into their couplings. Now the, the, then the question is, uh, well, what a stacking order it is, right? So for the bulk crystal, my clarity already Measure there's actually a phase transition, a crystal structure phase transition at the 200 around 200 kelvins. So the high temperature it's a monoclonic phase. When you go to low temperature, it's a rhombohedral phase. Therefore, in a bulk crystal, it's a ferromagnetic order, right? Consistent with the theory, you know, if it's rhombohedral, it should be ferromagnetic. Now, well, what can happen in these uh, bilayers, right? Is it the monoclonic or rhombohedral? So. To, to identify these, we use a second harmonic generation measurement. Now, the key message for second harmonic is uh, it's very sensitive to crystal uh, symmetries because uh, in order to get a second harmonic generation, you know, under these electrodipole approximations, the inversion symmetry will break. And uh, the, the second harmonic generation has been used actually to, to measure these anti <coughs> magnetic order in the bulk crystals. And there's uh, quite a few interesting you know, review work if you, if you, if you want to know more about it, you can look into these papers. So for our work, let's just look at the, the crystal symmetry of this chromium triad. And in the bulk crystal, in the model layers, has these, these D3D crystal symmetries, actually has inversion symmetry, so there's no second harmonic generation. And in a bilayer, when these two crystals align in the same, same directions, no matter how you slide them, right? Because model layer is already central symmetric. If you put another material, you can just convince yourself. If it's also in the same orientation, no matter how you slide it, the central symmetry doesn't break. Okay? So for the bilayer, it's also central symmetric. And the second harmonic duration, it's electrodipole forbidden transitions. But now if we add this uh, spinning structure into the systems, okay? And you see is in this anti ferromagnetic ground state, right? If you do an inversion symmetry operations, now the left hand state is going to go to the right hand side, these two are different state. So what it means is inversion symmetry actually breaks due to this layered anti ferromagnetic order. Therefore, the second harmonic generation should be allowed. Now if I apply a large enough magnetic field to turn the system into this ferromagnetic state, then the inversion symmetry actually restores. Then the second harmonic generation should be electro depth forbidden again, right? So, so this work is a collaboration with the Sui Wu group at the Fudan University. The, and the, here just uh, you know, the setup. And first, we, we, we measure the second harmonic generation from the a bilayer at the 50 Kelvin, which is above the Curie temperature. And clearly, we don't see any second harmonic generations. Then we cool down the samples right, at below the, at the 15 Kelvin. So for, at the 5 Kelvin, actually, in this case, first we, we Measure the second harmonic generation intensity map at the zero field means that in the anti ferromagnetic ground state, we do see a very strong second harmonic generation signal show that. Second, if we measure the minus one P, the spin aligned, now you can see the second <coughs> harmonic generation actually vanishes, right? This is consistent with what I just told you. Anti ferromagnetic states break the inversion symmetry, but the, the fully spin polar states actually restore the inversion symmetries. And we can also just map the the, the signal strength as a function of temperatures. So below the Curie tem this uh, critical temperature, the signal is strong, but it drops as we warm up and the until it vanishes as the manual order also vanishes. Okay? So this demonstrates the second harmonic generation we measured is really coming from these layered anti-ferromagnetisms. 
and we all can quantify the strength of this uh, um, second homogeneous signal. It's remarkably large. So here I compare, for example, the second homogeneous signal from this, uh, the, the, the classic example of bulk crystal chromium 2 you know, trioxide, it's an antiferromagnet. And the signal from this bilayer actually is about 500 times larger than these bulk crystals. We can also compare the SSG from these, uh, the other 2D crystals, like Mali MOS2 or Mali HBN. The bilayer CS3 is also stronger. Okay? So this gives us a kind of unique opportunity, right? We can control the main order then to switch this uh, uh, very strong nonlinear optical signal. Okay, the next is, now we look at the, the, the crystal symmetry between the difference between this rhombohedral and the monoclonic, right? Rhombohedral has these uh, three-fold rotation symmetries, but the monoclonic is C2H. What it means is you only have a two-fold rotation symmetry and with a mirror plane. Then we can use this. We can use the uh, angle result, the second homogeneation, to kind of, uh, to, to, let me skip it, to, 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 to resolve the symmetry of the crystals. So here's what I mean, right? We do these azimuth so angle result second homo generations. What I, what I show you here is that this azimuth angle phi is in the plane. And here's a two pattern you show here, right? The black color means excitation laser and also detection laser polarization that are collinear with each other. And the red color means excitation and the detection is orthogonal to each other. At least just two different uh, detection schemes for the second homo generations. And uh, you can see that the pattern actually doesn't have a three-fold rotation symmetry, right? It's clear. So what it means is rhombohedral is not a crystal structure for this bilayer. But if you look at it, well, you clearly see there's a mirror plane here, right? And the solid line I show here is the fit of the data use uh, the C2H symmetry, all right? So basically, well, the bilayer actually looks like a monoclonic structures. To confirm that, we can also try do the same measurements, but they use different excitation laser energies. So once you tune laser energies, the detailed pattern of, of the second common generation, it changes, right? This is because, well, this detailed pattern is uh, determined by the local electronic transition, which is in resonance with the laser. So the pattern will rotate. But the, for all these three patterns, right, you can already tell this one thing is the same, which is this mirror plane, always in these directions. This is determined by the crystal <coughs> structures. We can also fit the data really well with C2H symmetry, all these three samples, all these three different patterns. So the conclusion is, for bilayer chromium triiode, it has these C2H symmetries and it has monoclonic stackings. And uh, there's no monoclonic to rubber crystal structure phase transition in common thing chromium triiodes. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and we can keep looking to these uh, problems. You know, look at the, the, the stacking order. So let me just uh, another kind of a careful look. So for union cell, right? There's a chromium atom in the middle, and uh, there's uh, three atom out on top and three at the bottom. And both of them actually has these 180 degree rotations from each other, from top and bottom. Okay, and if I look from the top. Now you can see we label a color here, right? So there's a blue color, six of them here. These are the six chromium atoms from these hexagonal line structures. Then there's three, the red three other atom, which is the one at the top. And the gray one is three at the bottom. So we can link them with these uh, solid line triangles, right? The green solid triangle is the atom on the top, this triangle. And the bottom one, you know, this dash one is at the bottom, okay? Remember this picture? Then, then we can look at the, we can simplify this. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I only draw these uh, green ones, right? And look at here. So this is a top view simplified structure, you know, this triangle corresponding to these green triangles. And uh, I have two vector here, which is the AB lattice. All right, this is how we define in the model layers. Simple structure, right, four triangles with AB is my lattice vector, my vectors. 
Then if you add another layer, right, now I have a bilayer system. So this pink color represents the top layer structure, and the, bottom, the green one represents the bottom layers. Now this top and bottom, these triangles, they can have a relative shift, OK? They, orient they, they have the same orientation, but they can have a relative shift. So this shift to give us uh, these uh, R-type stacking structures for the bilayer chromium triadex. And the, you know, the, 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 the middle row here is uh, the, the unit structure from this bilayer. You can see how these shifts happen. Right? They can, the, the, the bottom row just shows what is uh, the, the coordinates in terms of A and the B, these two vectors. So there's a many different kinds, actually. It's not that very simple. Depends on these vectors, how they shift. We can have a rhombohedral structure, we can have a monoclinic structure, for example. And there's a, another type, which I haven't mentioned to you. It's called edge type stacking. The difference, right, in the R stacking, what I mentioned to you in the R stacking is uh, the top triangle and the bottom triangle has one ID degree rotation, right? Remember? But for R stacking is uh, for a single layer, the top three atoms, the bottom three other atoms, actually, they orient in the same direction. There's no one ID degree rotations, okay? So with that, you know, there's another structure which is called edge type stackings. And nobody discuss it, right? Because uh, all the, you know, all the paper we see and all the X-ray differential says this crystal should be in the R stackings, but there's no edge stacking. So there's another mystery. Another mystery is another class of uh, uh, chromium trihalide, which is chromium triboride. Somehow, right, all the paper, and uh, including us, we also studied, chromium triboride is actually a ferromagnetic insulator. This is kind of a mystery because chromium triboride and chromium triboride, they, you know, they're the same thing, right? The only difference is just uh, the highlight is different. But in the same class, why one material is anti ferromagnetic, the other is actually ferromagnetic? Now we all know, right? It has to be something to do with the stacking. So, uh, Si Wei and also uh, 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 Chen Wei at uh, Fudan University, they, they, they look at these problems when, when we discuss you know, the, the physics and the difference between these two. So, what they decide to do is uh, we all know that for all the exfoliated chromium and triboride, so far for, en for, for every you know, thing we measured, also from different group reported, they're also ferromagnetic. So, what they decide to do is they actually started MBE growth. So, here they show they can do. And we grows of molecular chromium triboride, and also with uh, bilayer islands on top, right? Then, because they do MV growth, means they can directly use scanning tunnel microscopy to image the atomic structures. Then they can use uh, magnetic tips, these spin parts tips, to study the magnetic order at the same time. Then you can directly correlate the, the stacking order to this magnetic order, okay? That's the basic idea. So first, well, just imagine the model there, and they see all these triangles, okay? So these triangles, each, you know, there's three atoms here. These triangles corresponding to the three atom, sorry, three boron atoms on top. As I showed you, I told you to the beginning, right? These triangles, okay? Do you follow me on this part? Then, you can do spring parts, the STS or ST measurements, and the, uh, and the, uh, with, then you can see this hysteresis, right? So it means it's a ferromagnet in the model, yeah? It's not so a surprise. Well, then we can also look at the bilayer. Now this is uh, what's interesting come, right? what's the interesting result? So in the bilayer, you can image the atomic structure of the top of the bilayer, okay? Then you know what's the orientation of this triangle, right? You know, but by imaging the top, you know the triangle orientations. No, you can also image the bottom layer, which is the extended model layer underneath the, this bilayer, right? We extend it out. So then you can map out the, the triangles of this bottom layer. So basically now you know the, tri the, spin the crystal structure, this triangle orientation in the top layer. And now also you also know the crystal, the triangle orientation in the bottom layer. Make sense, right? Then you can put them together. What we found is, actually, it's edge stacking. It's not the it's not the the, the monoclinic rhombohedral R stacking I was talking about. So it's edge stacking. So for the edge stacking, 
indeed you have a ferromagnetism. That's what the, the conclusion. Okay. But what's really interesting is they also found there's an R stacking in a system, you know, just random. So for the it's the same idea, right? You just measure the crystal structure, you know, the, the basically the, the orientation of these triangles for the top layer and the bottom layer, then you extend it, you, you figure out what's uh, the stacking order for these uh, bilayers, then become it turned out to be R stacking. And in the R stacking, it determined actually it's anti ferromagnet. Right? So these are actually really nice results because we directly correlate is a stacking arrangement to the magnet order. Okay, so now hopefully we establish uh, you know there's a correlation between the the layer slide uh, stacking arrangement right to these magnet orders. And last, uh, I'll show you examples how we can control this layer stacking and to these magnet orders. So. Let's go back to a chromium trial day, and uh, I remind you of the simple results we have. Let's see how, how much time I have. Maybe now ten minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. So for this, uh, um, yeah, remember it's monoclonic, it's antiferromagnetic, and for ramahedra, it's ferromagnetic. Then we try to apply the hydrostatic pressures, okay, to control the interlayer couplings. So here's examples, right? Uh, what we have is we make these uh, sample with uh, you know basically tunneling structures. I will just talk to you, and we measure the tunneling current okay, at a zero pressures. Then we can increase the pressure. Uh, just skip these slides. You can increase the pressure. You can see the critical field for spin flip transition increases. Right. This just shows by applying pressure, you indeed increase the interlayer couplings. Okay. And I can map out the interlayer coupling as function pressure represent these black dots. You know, we can increase the interlayer coupling actually by twice, you know, factor two. The blue one represents the critical temperature for many order to form. But you can see these, uh, the critical temperature doesn't increase much, only increase from 44 Kelvin to about 47 Kelvin. This is small. And this also makes sense because the critical temperature is actually determined by intralayer exchange interactions. But the intralayer exchange interaction doesn't really depend on interlayer coupling, right? So all the results make sense. As we keep increasing the pressure, what we see is this sharp spring flip transition actually vanishes at the highest of pressures. What we see is only these kind of slope, manual resistance. This is coming from the graphene context, okay? But the spring flip transition have disappeared. What what what, the, what this indicates is, well, maybe the anti ferromagnetic states already trans transition into a ferromagnetic states, right? To confirm that, we take the sample out, then we perform magnetic off the curl rotation measurements. And here, uh, just to remind you, if for a pre stacking bilayer in the monoclonic structure, we do see the vanish of these uh, uh, curl rotation signal, so we do have anti ferromagnetism. Now, for the sample, after we apply pressure. Okay. The correlation signal is complete change, right? Now we see a strong hysteresis curve. Bilayer now becomes a ferromagnet after the pressures. So the, the simple message is this layer sliding actually tune the system from these anti ferromagnet to ferromagnet transitions. So what's interesting is, uh, well, in the trial layer, we can engineer actually multiple magnetic states. So again, right in a trilayer, the top one is uh, the tunneling current measurements without pressure, the bottom is with pressure, and we can see the critical field for spin flip transition increases just as we saw in a bilayer, right? Everything is consistent. But what it, what's interesting is, at the higher pressures, I observe there's a intermediate state showed up, okay? This means there's a new magnetic state appeared at the higher pressures. And uh, this new state, is coming from another anti ferromagnetic state. So here, you know, I define two type anti ferromagnetic states. The first one is called anti ferromagnetic states one or F one. F one is just the one I already talked to you, right? With uh, two in, two anti ferromagnetic interface, yeah, spin up, spin down, spin up. So there's two interfaces. It's anti ferromagnetic, just like natural crystals. But uh, for anti ferromagnetic state two is F two. Now there's only one interface is ferromagnetic. The other interface becomes ferromagnetic. So what you can think of is, if it's just a bilayer, right? 
the system already become ferromagnetic, right? Think about the bile I just talked to you, you know, it's ferromagnetic. But now I just add another layer to the bottom. So it means that the bottom layer, the, the, the layer sliding hasn't happened, but the top layer, there's already layer sliding. The, the stacking already changed. So we can confirm that is, look at this spin fluid transition. So you already know, right, as we apply the magnetic field, and when the Zeeman energy overcomes the spin flip transitions, overcome this interlayer coupling, then the, the spin will flip. But therefore, AFM2 only has one interface, right? And for the AFM1 has two interfaces. So what it means is the energy we need to flip the spins in this AFM1 to have to overcome these two interfaces compared to one interface in the AFM2, right? So the critical field we need to flip the spin in the AFM1 should be twice what we need for the AFM2. Okay, do you follow this? Very simple argument. So we can see there's two spin flip transition, right? The first transition happened at the 1.7 Tesla. The second is, uh, roughly speaking, you know, it's about twice of it, it's 3.7 Tesla. So the first spin flip transition actually pointing to these AF2, flip into these ferromagnetic states, and the second transition corresponding to these uh, AF1, the spin flip transition, to into these fully spin polar state. Okay, and uh, what's interesting is, now we, we, we park our magnetic field, and uh, we now I scan the, the bias. Okay, here's what I did, we scan the bias. But we finally, we can use electric current to flip these two states, okay? So the, first of all, I will tell you, this transition, you know, this whole process is uh, non-reversible. Only happened once. So it's also lucky you have a good student, you know, he, he, he take really careful data, so he didn't miss this, right? If you just take a bias, you, you don't know what's going on, then you don't, you don't know, basically. So, so what we did is we just scan the bias, and then we see a jump. Then, then we scan the bias black, you got this blue curve, but doesn't go back to a red curve, right? So this transition happens where you have electric current to, to switch the, the system from these anti ferromagnetic states one into anti ferromagnetic states two. So how do I know that? Well, very simple. Now what I do is I can scan the magnetic field again to match the tunneling current. So the top point is before the switch happened, the bottom is after the state switching. So what you see is after state switching, only the lower field transition, right? states, the top one already vanishes. So what that means is now all the states I have is in this anti ferromagnetic states one. Sorry, in the anti ferromagnetic states two, okay? All right, and uh, we can also image the, the, the these magnetic states in a real space. So we take the sample out and we do these uh, correlation measurements. On top here, I show the optical image with two layers and you know, three layers, but in this sample, I actually have a two layer there. So if I just do a, Monk measurements on these two layers, you see a fair minus states. So consistent with what I showed you. And now if I map the, the different spots in this tri-layer, P and Q and R, we see very different uh, behaviors, okay? Let's see. So for these fair minus states, right, at this particular spot R, we do see a fair minus state show up. But in this P and a Q, they have a three spin flip transitions. And uh, we find these two, one is AFM1 and the other AFM2. The way, the, the way to do it is very simple, as I already mentioned to you, right? Just look at uh, the magnetic field that we need to, to, to realize this spin flip transition. For the AFM2, only one interface is anti ferromagnetic. For the AFM1, there's two interfaces, right? Therefore, the field we need for AFM1 for this spin flip transition should be twice for AFM2. So that's what we see. Yeah. For FM1, we need two Tesla. For the FM2, we only need one Tesla. So that's how we can tell we do have these two different states. Then next is uh, we, we try to map these two states out in a real space. And uh, the little trick we do is, you can see the, the spin flip transition, right, for all these fields, for all these different uh, magnetic states, they happen in a different uh, critical field. So the first, imagine, just follow me, I scale the magnetic fields down, I take a Mock spatial map at the two Tesla. Okay, so it is a map I got. Then I switch fields down again and I park at this particular field at uh, 1.3 Tesla. Then I take another map, right? So what you see is at these two particular fields, only AFM1 has been for the transition. AFM2 and the ferromagnetic states both doesn't change, right? Therefore, I just take a difference of these two maps and it will give me a net signal. 
this net signal it will correspond into this empty fragment state one, right? So this area. Okay, the next, I can do the same measurements. Now I keep switching my field down. I take a map of one Tesla and take another map of 0.4 Tesla. And the, here, only the AFM2 has spin flip transitions. Then I take a difference of these two. Then I get uh, this area corresponding to the anti minus states two. Last, let's try to map out these ferro minus states. It's a little more tricky for the ferro minus states. Let me go back a little bit. Is we take a map of the zero Tesla and the minus 0.5 Tesla. So for these two fields, the anti state phase one doesn't change, but for FM2 also has spin flow transitions. But there's a difference, right? Is you can see the signal change for the Feynman phase is much larger than the signal change from this anti Feynman state two. Okay, so you can see the large drop here, right? Larger than four percent. So what I do is then we can take a difference of these two maps, but set the signal threshold larger than four percent. Then we can isolate this area for these Feynman states. Okay, so by doing this, we actually to map out this. Uh, the area for these different uh, magnetic phases, right? As I show you here, we have anti minus states one and anti states two, and with minus states. So this is just a simple example. You know, we can control the pressure, control different layer stackings, then control these uh, magnetic configurations in the system. And uh, lastly, the example I want to show you is uh, well, this process is actually a little bit random right now. We we cannot control it. For example, here's another sample we measured. We has two layer, three layer, five layers, and we just apply the pressure, and then, and then we take it out from the pressure cell. We do mock measurements. This is just a three particular spot I choose. Here. So you see, it's all always is a it's a hysteresis curve. So it means actually in this particular case, we turn the whole sample into ferro minus states. Okay. All right. So I was just stop here and uh, for the first part. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, any questions? <laughs> yes, please. So in different layers of samples, when you switch the ferromagnet and the antiferromagnet states, they have like different size of hysteresis. Is it related to the Number of interfaces, or it's related to other. It's related to the anisotropies. Anisotropies. Yeah. Uh, I I have one question. Yeah. Um, uh, so the uh, uh, pressure has uh, uh, the effect uh, to cause a phase transition. Let's say from uh, Ramahedra to uh, Monokini. So um, uh, after you take out from the pressure seal. Um, uh, the uh, state of the monoclinic uh, remains. So, um, is there a possible way to, you know, uh, further like a uh, reverse back? Uh, yes. So this is a very good question, and uh, we're working on this. Is the simple solution just heat it up, right? Heat the crystal up to some temperature, then the phase transition should happen again. You know, the crystal structure. Yeah. Then what is the phase transition temperature? We don't know. Uh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. see. <laughs> That's a work in progress. Yeah. Because imagine, right? This all. All this measurement I'm talking about is uh, is irreversible, and uh, there's chance you heat it up just someplace damaged. So it, it's not a it's not a fast turnaround <coughs> measurement. Have you tried to rotate the sample to switch from one setting to the other? Yeah, we did that. Then uh, this is also hard to control because of. Uh, when you, when you stack them, right, there's a lot of, you know, the angle rotations and also inhomogeneous in the samples, we see all kinds of states, actually. So, so it's difficult to resolve. Any other question? If not, let's uh, thank our speaker again. Mm -hmm.